Welcome back to the latest episode of the podcast, The Way Out Is In. I am Joe Confino. And I am Brother Fap Hu. And today in this episode, we're going to be talking about Zen and the art of mindful living. Most of us live incredibly busy lives, and we're often caught up in all our busyness. But actually, if we take account of every moment, we can come back to ourselves, we can find the joy. And in today's episode, we shall also have a guest, Sister Jai Nim from the nuns community in Plum Village. The way out is in. Brother Fapu, do you want to just say hello to everyone? Hello, everyone, to all of our friends who have been following us from the beginning. And hello to all of our new friends that are joining us today for the first podcast. Yes. For their first podcast. Yes. So, um, so we are here to talk today about mindfulness. And the thing about mindfulness is, to many people, it's very new. I mean, this, is, this has come into the sort of mainstream of Western society, and a lot of people are talking about it and teaching it. But of course, mindfulness comes from the time of the Buddha. And, um, and in the Plum Village tradition of as and Master Thich Nhat Hanh, um, mindfulness is actually one of the key practices that helps us to live a better life. So, Brother Fapu, do you want to just um, give us a sense, what, what is mindfulness? Simply, mindfulness is the energy that allows us to be in touch with the present moment. And to come in touch with the energy of mindfulness, we do need to have a practice. And a practice here, it can be called a meditation or an exercise. And what we like to focus on as a basic um, practice is the breath. So most of the time, our mind is elsewhere and our body is here, but we are thinking in 10,000 directions. And for us to really live, the Buddha teaches us that we have to be able to touch the present moment. And so to be in the present moment, we have to allow ourselves, allow our mind and body to come together for it to unite. It sounds much easier than done. So what we like to invite people to do is to connect to their breath, let the breath become a bridge. And as they become aware of the breath, suddenly what is happening is that they're bringing their attention, their mind to the to their body. And at that moment, we can start to see that we are becoming more aware of what is happening inside of us and around us. So mindfulness is an energy of awareness. And to cultivate mindfulness, we also have to develop the following um, energy that goes along with mindfulness, which is concentration. And I think most of us are in that state where we are mindful of an instant, but then we forget right away. For example, let's say we're all enjoying the sunset. The sunset is a beauty of the environment, of planet Earth, of what we can witness. Let's say in that split second, we recognize the sun is setting and it is beautiful. But if we don't have any concentration, we don't know how to dwell in that moment, our mind will go into autopilot and we will start thinking about the past or the future, or be carried away by our emotions, our thoughts. And then once again, we lose that moment. So mindfulness is the energy of cultivating awareness in our daily life. So one of the things about um, concentration, I once interviewed Thich Nhat Hanh, and I was asking him about, because a lot of businesses and even the military are using mindfulness, but not to develop their sort of sense of compassion or love, but to be more focused and to earn more money or or with the military to be better at shooting people dead. Mm. And I asked him about other people using mindfulness in that way. And he, he asked me a rhetorical question. He said, is a thief picking a lock practicing mindfulness? Mm. And he said, no, they're practicing concentration. Concentration on its own is not enough. He says that it's about concentration that then leads to this openness of more compassion, more understanding. So can you just give us a sense of 
how we flow from concentration into more compassion, more awareness, more love. Right. Mindfulness has to be right mindfulness. And so mindfulness is part of the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path. And mindfulness is one of them. And then it leads to concentration, which gives us more focus, more stability. And I think this is something that's quite crucial of today's uh, society because we're so fast paced. And for, for us to actually learn to be still is such an art. And to have compassion, to have love, there's a very key ingredient, which is understanding. A lot of the time, our teacher, Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, he would define love as understanding. Because if you want to have compassion and to have love, you have to have understanding. And to have understanding, you need to have attention and time and focus in order to understand. And so understanding can give rise that could give birth to compassion and love. And so if we are mindful of someone we love, we look at him or her deeply, we see his beauty, her beauty, but at the same time, we can also see his or her weaknesses or his or her suffering. But when you can see his or her suffering, actually what is born at that moment is compassion because we as an individual, we also have suffering. So when we can identify somebody else's suffering, we can see them as just us. And also because often things spark our emotions, don't they? It's like um, we're going along, something happens to us, and suddenly it's, it's like an earthquake tremor, and all, all the fault lines we have inside of us sort of burst open, and the, all these strong emotions come up. So does mindfulness help us actually deal with those strong emotions when they come up, and, and how do we work with them? Mindfulness... Uh allows us to see our emotions and to recognize it when it is happening. And first of all, we have to develop this awareness. This We call it in the Buddhist language, we say we all have a seed of mindfulness, a seed of awareness. And at the same time, we have other seeds such as frustration, anger, anxiety, fear, violence. And most of the time, especially when it's on the level of an emotion or a feeling, we allow the emotion and the feeling to carry us away through our action of what we say, what we do, or even the way we look at someone. And most of the time we're doing it without knowing that we are doing it. So mindfulness tells us, hey, you are angry right now. Know that you are angry. And suddenly if you know you are angry, then you have a question you have to ask yourself, at this moment, I know I'm angry. What should I do? Should I retaliate? Should I do something to punish him or her? And maybe most of us will have that tendency because it triggers us. But if we have learned about the teachings of mindfulness, concentration, and insight, which I spoke about, which gives rise to understanding compassion, then suddenly we want to become more of a compassionate person, then with mindfulness, we can say, no, I will not retaliate. I want to take care of my anger. So one of our mindfulness trainings that we have as a practitioner in Plum Village, when we are angry, we don't do or say anything. We have to come back and take care of that seed of anger. And what our teacher would encourage us is to practice walking meditation. So to develop the seed of mindfulness, we have to have a few formal practice that we can develop in our daily life so that we can always come back to when we have the strong emotion come up and we want to invite mindfulness to be present to take care of these strong emotions. And in a sense, what this is all about is about getting to know ourselves, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So um, so one of the things for me is, is um, which I, I learned through sort of Western psychology, but it's it's very similar. It's to become a, a good observer of yourself because when we observe ourselves as though we're an outsider looking at ourselves in, then we can develop instant understanding. It's like the wise person watching you that you're about to set off. So I, I had something today, brother, where um, I got very frustrated because I'm dealing with a lot of bureaucracy in France and and issues around our house. And today I just thought, oh my God, I'm I'm coming to do a a podcast on mindfulness and I'm feeling stressed and overwhelmed. This is not the energy I want to bring. 
But actually, the most important thing is, as you say, is to say, actually, right now, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling sort of frustrated. And this is what I'm feeling. And, and to start working with those emotions rather than being controlled in them. Because I think what happens is people often get controlled by their emotions, don't they? And, and in the ultimate way, that's what often happens when people commit suicide. It's like the feeling is so strong in that moment. The, the pain is so strong mm. that it feels like the, it's impossible to continue. Mm. Can mindfulness help in those sort of extreme situations? Mindfulness is um, the capacity to also see the beauty of life. And when we practice being in the present moment, we're also training ourselves to recognize the beauty that is inside of us and all around us. And this is very important. So if we have the eye of meditation, the eye of mindfulness, and we can see that even though I have seeds of anger, of strong emotions, but at the same time in me are also all these wonderful seeds such as love, compassion, joy, um, freedom, hope. And so our practice is also to connect to those seeds inside of us. And mindfulness is also to remind ourselves that we, we are love, we are compassion, we are also non-discrimination. So practicing mindfulness is not just to practice when we suffer. This is really important. A lot of the time, our teacher would encourage us, right now, when you are happy, invest in your practice. Because when that moment comes, when the storm arises, you don't go look for, for a refuge. That moment, you are the refuge. And can you talk a bit about the present moment? You keep on referring to the present moment. And, and it's taken me a long time to recognize what it means to dwell in the present moment. Because, if, you know, even when I wake up, like in the mornings, I'm thinking about the past. I, I sort of lie in bed and I think, oh, my God, I should have done this. And why didn't I do that? And it goes all the way back to my childhood. Sometimes, oh, God, if I had only done that, then my life would be this now or my children would be that. And then I'm also thinking about, what I need to do in the future. And so the present moment feels really, really squeezed. Mm. And, and, and for, I would imagine, many people listening to this podcast, you know, busy, complex, trying to manage kids, trying to manage work and kids, trying to manage work, kids and a partner, trying to manage work, kids and a partner and a house, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You know, how, isn't it a bit much to ask people to sort of stop? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, in our training, we are taught to be aware of the three times, which is the past, the present, and the future. And we can never control these three times. Time is, is almost like it's a notion because we give second and minute to, to identify time, right? But at the same time, if you are a free person, and you are not caught in the past or the future, you're living in the moment. But our tendency is that sometimes we identify with experiences and we can only see ourselves of a past experience. Or we are in a state where we're always, we're trained to always project ourselves to the future. And therefore we're always living in a state of running after something whether it is for our own accomplishment or for our community, our family, our loved ones. So when we reflect on the present moment, we may like to ask ourselves, am I really just an instrument to run after something? Either it is the past or the present or the future, or can I actually take care of myself in the present moment? Buddhism doesn't say only live in the present moment because that's only where life is available. Because actually the past is also a history book for us to gain experience from. But if we ask, what is the future made of? It is made of the here and the now. So one of the most challenging challenge that our teacher gave us is, if you want to take care of the future, learn to handle the present moment. So, so that's a wonderful example, brother. And, and um, it reminds me that one of the 
I think the first really deep insights in my life was um, I was living in New York mm. and I was uh, when I was writing for a newspaper called The Daily Telegraph and I, I went to New Orleans to do a weekend workshop with a, with a very well-known uh, psychologist, I suppose, called John Bradshaw. Mm. And he took us on this journey, um, this visualization going back to heal our child uh, our childhood wounds he was mm. that that was a lot of what his work was based on and what i realized through that visualization is in the present moment i could travel back in time to meet myself as a child as who i am now mm. and help that child who at that time where i found my child was an 8 year old mm. crying in his bedroom at home and i was able to reach back in time from the present moment and be there for him and through that process, I actually got a lot of healing. By healing the past in the present moment, I changed who I am now because actually I was healing an old wound. Mm. And by healing the old wound, I was very, by its nature, changing my future. Mm. So as I got this real insight of sort of almost this, this visual visualization of stand, standing up and the, my trunk, my body being, in a sense, the present moment. And from that strength and foundation, I could reach one arm out to my left to reach into the past mm. and heal that and put my right hand out outstretched to represent the future and that by being in the present moment i could heal the past and by its nature transform the future wow that's a beautiful sharing joe thank you and i i've also had some um some tough moments as a child growing up and and one of it was being bullied and um, I remember when I first came into the community, into the monastery, um, suddenly I am not with my family, with my, f um, my friends. And I, I had to learn to make new friends. And most of the monks were of the age of um, my teachers, like maybe in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And then I started to realize I had a natural habit of fear towards a certain um, brothers, monks in the community, maybe because they hold a certain authority just around them. And I carried this for a few years as a monk. And I, I always ask myself, why whenever I'm around them, I would turtle, I would go into a shell. And I started to realize, I started to recognize as I meditate on this state of being, I started to realize, oh, it comes from my past. When I was young, I had a particular cousin who would always bully me. I didn't know why he bullied me because I, I was a very kind kid, I would think. <laughs> and I don't believe that I've done anything to be punished like this. And through this meditation, I started to look at my cousin who was a refugee, who went through um, a time of life and death, whether he would survive or not. And then he had to go through refugee camp, which I heard stories from my father, which it wasn't pleasant. And so I could start to see that he has so much suffering and so much frustration. And especially coming to a new country like Canada, where he had to learn English, he had to learn a new culture. And I'm sure there was so many frustration in him that he didn't know where to, where to release it. And so I became a victim of that. And suddenly I touched that past in that present moment, just like how you touch your eight-year-old child. And I, I, I felt this liberation because suddenly I was able to see the root of that habit of turtling around people who I projected this, this fear upon them. And suddenly I had to re-channel myself and I would remind myself, Fahu, you know, my name, Fahu, the people you're around, they're maybe one of the most kindest people in the world. Stop copying and pasting this image of your cousin on these people. And the more I did that, the more I allow myself to be a new person, to have new view in this present moment. Yeah. yeah. So in a sense, being in the present moment is healing ourselves. Right. Because actually we're no longer a victim of the past or fearful of the future we are we can be whole we can be ourselves in this moment right and it's only when we're truly ourselves that we can actually go into the past and heal things because we're bringing that awareness mm. of who we truly are so mm. it's actually a, about lifting the veil and being present to ourselves i would suspect 
That's that's very correct. And when you talk about healing, I I really connect with that because I started to realize that I when I was becoming a teenager, I was also becoming violent to to some of my younger cousin because action is a teaching. So I was transmitted this violence from one of my cousins to me without me even wanting it. And suddenly when I was frustrated, I would do the same thing. I would act exactly the same way. So we can say it's samsara. It's just going in circle. And when I recognized the seed, you know, I had a particular cousin who I felt I was really mean to. And as a monk, one of our practice is to learn to heal our past and to ask for forgiveness. And so I, I called up my cousin, my younger cousin one day, and I called her and and I said, hey, um, I'm calling today. I just wanted to take this time to say sorry. Sorry for the past. And she's like, wait, we haven't seen each other for like three years. Why are you saying sorry? Because now I live in France and she's still living in Canada. And I said, well, it's from the time when we were much younger. And I would recount some of the stories. I said, do you remember when I behaved this way? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had no idea why you did that. And I, I told her, I'm like, I'm very sorry for those actions. Today, thanks to mindfulness, I am aware of what I have done. I would like to put a stop to it. And I would like to ask for your forgiveness. After that call, and after recognizing um, that experience, one thing that came to me was I was able to end that suffering because I imagine if I wasn't able to say sorry to my cousin, then maybe one day she would also react those violence to her children or her younger um, cousins. And that would just keep going on and on. So taking care of the past in the present moment can be very healing. And then that allows us to create new, beautiful past in this present moment. Wow. I, I love that idea that being in the present moment can heal generations mm. into the future. And actually, it comes back to what we were discussing in the last episode about the power of our actions right. and our thoughts, that actually every thought and action, no, there's no such thing as a, a, a a thought and action that is neutral. Mm. Everything has an impact. So actually that means that every time we open our mouths, every time we have a thought, it's either going to create something of beauty or it's going to create something that creates hardship. It can't be in the middle. It can't be nothing. So, brother, you were the close attendant of Thich Nhat Hanh for around 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm. Tell us about his practice of mindfulness, because, you know, in a sense, you know, hundreds of thousands of people benefit from his teachings. But what was it like to observe him? Um, to simply say it, his action is mindfulness itself. And being around him was... Um, just like being around a ball of mindfulness energy, but it comes from discipline. It comes from training and um, determination. So our monastery life is a discipline, it's a training um, for us to cultivate mindfulness in our daily life. I would say one of like his superpower <laughs> would be to enjoy each moment and not waste a single moment. And for example, one thing that I still cannot do today and that I still aspire to be able to have that strength is even though he's a simple monk, he would like to call himself a simple monk and a very free and lazy monk. But at the same time, looking at his legacy, he's done so much. And already looking at the collection of books that he has written is a lot. And part of my, my time as his attendant is... Um, getting to witness him write new books as well as to translate new sutras from um, Chinese into English, Vietnamese, or from um, Sanskrit, etc. And every time it came time to a meal, 
our task as an attendant was to prepare his meal, uh, set up the table. And I would come up to him and I would say, I would join my palms and we would bow and we'd say, Dear Tai, it is time for lunch. We would like to invite you to lunch. And almost within a few seconds, he would put his pen down or his book down or whatever he's doing. And he would just come to the meal. And it's something so simple. But now that I'm more busy than before, whenever I hear the bell for for lunch or for dinner or for breakfast, the first thing that comes up to my mind is um, the line's going to be a little bit long. I can wait a little bit longer. And suddenly I start to see that I'm not taking care of the present moment because later on I have to rush to the meal and then I cannot enjoy that that present moment. I cannot enjoy mindful eating. I cannot enjoy just standing in line, for example. So I can say that one of his um, capacity of being mindful is also learning to just be in the moment. And I, I had a moment when I was with Tai and we were walking and he stopped and he looked at me and he asked me, what gatas are you practicing when you practice walking meditation? Gatas are our meditation poems. And our teacher has written a lot of them to help us uh, focus, have attention uh, to the steps that we take or when we turn on the water, water flows from high mountains. So the gratitude can be born. And at that moment, I, I was just saying, dear Tai, um, I'm still just recognizing left foot, right foot. Because I was still so, so young at the practice. And my mind was always jumping in 10,000 directions. So just the fact of knowing that this is a left foot making a step and this is a right foot making a step is already a lot for me. And then I'd ask Tai, and I'm like, Tai, how about you? And I, I would expect from a Zen master would say, Tai doesn't need to practice because I'm at this level. And Tai looked at me and he said, Tai is practicing. I have arrived. I am home in the here, in the now. And I was in shock almost because I didn't think someone at Thai's advance in meditation would still be doing something so simple. But at that moment, I realized that even as a Buddha, to continue to have mindfulness, you have to cultivate it every day, every moment. Beautiful. Yeah. And brother, can you just give for people who don't know, you talk about walking meditation. Mm. What, what, what actually is walking meditation and how can you practice it? And, and can you do running meditation as well or is it just walking? Can you just give us a, just a practical sense of what you mean by that? Yes, walking meditation is a, a form of practice that allows us to connect our mind to the steps that we take in our daily life. And we have uh, formal ways of walking. We have two styles in our practice center. One is slow walking meditation, which we do in the meditation hall. And the other is normal walking meditation outside. And there's two benefits um, to both practices. Um, the one outside, it allows us to be in touch with our steps, the community that we're walking with, as well as nature. And I think in today's day, to come back to nature is really important because we're so uh, focused in um, the internet as well as many other things that are that are circulating around our life. So nature is a very essential energy for all of us. Um, and the key of it is, is to bring our mind home to the present moment with our steps. And we use the breath. So we would combine, let's say breathing in, I would take three steps as I breathe in and you are aware. In, as you breathe in, you can say in, in, in with the steps. And when you breathe out, you allow and you focus on the steps as you breathe out. You say out, 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 out. So doing this and training like this, you are allowing yourself to cultivate a habit of being with your body in this moment. And then slow walking meditation, which I, I enjoy a lot because... I procrastinate a lot. I think a lot. And my mind is um, a monkey. So concentration is something that I had to really develop. Um, so slow walking meditation is one breath for one step. So as you breathe in, you just make one step. And you almost want to combine that step with that out breath. 
And in the practice, you have to also relax your body. So a lot of people think when you practice meditation, you have to be very stiff or you have to be very rigid. Actually, in our practice, is coming back to the body is also learning to relax the body, be natural with the body. And so when you make this step with your in-breath, you can relax into that step. And as you breathe out, you take another step. And you can combine words to help your mind focus. For example, breathing in, we can say, I have arrived. Breathing out, I am home. I have arrived here means in the present moment. I am home here also means to be at home in this very moment. So that is the key of the practice to, to come back to the step to be fully in the present moment. Great, thank you. And and just just finally, you know, when you're, you're living in a monastery, and, and I know a lot of people think it's uh, very calm and quiet. In fact, you're you, you're just as busy as most people in the yeah. world, actually. But but when you when you look out in the world and you see, you know, the the rise of social media and just people being, never mind their their mind being in a thousand directions, they're being literally pulled in a thousand directions. Um, you know, with with this constant being fed information, constantly on the move, constantly new experiences, constantly different ways to experience life. I mean, it's it's quite overwhelming, actually. Yeah. And um, what 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 would be your advice to people who who you know people want to live an active life? They they're they're interested in life. They 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 want to look at what's going on, but. But how how do you balance out the fact that there's so much available with a need to slow down? How what would your advice to people be? Mm, resting is very important, and finding that practice or that condition to allow yourself to rest is so important in today's society. A lot of our suffering comes from stress, so I have found that meditation. The practice of mindfulness allows you to rest more deeply because um, having the intention is one, but doing is another. So having a form of practice that allows you to reconnect to yourself inside of you, to know where you are at in this present moment is so crucial, especially for leaders, right? When you're a leader, you have to be present. And so what we have discovered to offer presence, you have to learn to be there for yourself first. It's like, if you want to love someone, you have to have love for yourself first. So if you want to be fresh, if you want to give to the world, you also have to learn to be there for yourself, to give for yourself. So meditation, like we have said, it allows us to see ourselves more clearly. And when you see yourself more clearly, you can be also in touch with also all of the elements that are around you that is contributing to your being. And so you don't get lost, actually. You can actually empower yourself much more. Well, that's great because, um, as I said, I, I came into this <laughs> conversation feeling stressed, a bit overwhelmed, a bit angry, a bit frustrated. And, you know, as I always say, the proof is in the pudding. Mm. And now I feel calm, relaxed, wow. supple. So, um, so I don't know about you, our listeners, but I feel a lot better now. So thank you, brother, for the conversation. Thank you. And today in our um, podcast, we have a special guest. We have a first guest on our podcast. Hooray! Yay! We have Sister Jai Nim. Um, I'll allow her to introduce herself first. Yes, let's put her on the spot straight away. Sister, who are you? Hi, Joe, and hi, Brother Fapu. Thank you for having me on this podcast. Um, my name is Sister Jai Nim. Jai Nim means um, adornment with purification. This is the name I received from our teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh. We call him Thai, which means teacher in Vietnamese. Um, so we all receive a name when we ordain, and that becomes our practice for the rest of our life, basically. Wow. And tell us, sister, where, where do you come from and originally? And, and, um, 
And what attracted you to become a nun in this tradition? Well, um, I've lived in many places before arriving in Plum Village. I think I can say I'm Japanese. My, both of my parents are Japanese. I spend a lot of time also in the U.S. Um, and what brought me to the practice? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, fascinating. What, what was the conditions that allow you to get to know about Zen Master Ticket Han as well as the Plum Village community? Well, there's like a shorter version and longer version. Um, the, the shortest version I can give is to say that um, my ancestors have brought me here. Okay. Um, and I guess that needs a little bit more explanation. Yeah, I think um, I've always been on kind of spiritual search um, since, I would say, since my teenage years. I mm. think many of us, uh, we start to wonder more about life and what life is about and Maybe go through a difficult time as a teenager, depression. And um, so I've always been interested in spirituality, meditation, and yoga practice. And I think when actually both of my parents died in my 20s. Mm. So that was a big uh, event in my life. And that's when I really started to contemplate you know, what it means to live and what, what it means to die. And I think... Through that, um, I started reading a lot of Buddhist uh, books, and I met Thich Nhat Hanh, Thai's book. And one day I thought, oh, maybe I'd like to come and visit Plum Village. And immediately I felt at home. Mm-hmm. And after maybe two or three retreats, yeah, I felt very inspired to um, make this a full-time mm. uh, living, <laughs> if I can call it a living. <laughs> <laughs> And, and sister, well, you know, we, we're talking about mindfulness today. So it'd be really interesting to see, um, you know, a bit about how you practice mindfulness. And, and But also, more importantly, what changes has it brought to your life? Well, I think I remember there was one time I came to Plum Village and I attended a retreat as a lay person, meaning before I ordained as a nun. And I remember it was a Christmas New Year retreat. And we have this tradition here on New Year's Eve, we write um, um, aspiration. It's a little bit like a New Year's resolution, but we make a vow uh, on a piece of paper and we have a walking meditation all together as a community and we burn it in the bonfire. It's a very powerful, beautiful practice. Um, but I remember that year, somehow like I had this wish suddenly that I want to be responsible for my own happiness and suffering. And then that's something I wrote on the piece of paper that I want to practice and I want to be responsible for my own happiness no matter what happened in my life. Mm. And I think that's something mindfulness can really help with. You know, of course, you know, every day we have our ups and downs and we have small suffering, big sufferings. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we know that we are responsible about our own attitude and how we deal with everything that we face in our life that gives us the power, um, a kind of the ground that we know that no matter what happens, I will be okay. You know, Mm. I have, I have my own practice to go through this. And in the end, whenever I go through the difficulty, I will come out with like new insight. There's a new way of looking at life. Mm. And sister, one of the, things I love about this tradition and and you just raised it was you said we all have ups and downs and I know a lot of people Mm. have this sort of imagination that when you become a monastic um you know you you purify yourself and 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 everything becomes perfect and and people put themselves on a pedestal and look down at people living in the world and say (laughs) oh poor people living on but actually one of my one of the things I love about the humility of this tradition is is that you say we still face our ups and downs. So, so you know, what's it like living as a monastic in terms of you know does does it suddenly make life easier that everyone gets on beautifully together or actually you know what 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 actually is it like? Well, you know, we live here in Plum Village. We have about two hundred monks and nuns yeah. at the moment. We have. Um, monastery for monks uh, and then we have two nunneries uh, called Lower Hamlet and New Hamlet and I live in New Hamlet and right now we have about 60 sisters living together. Um, I think on brother's side we have more Western or European American brothers but 
on in New Hamlet. Yeah, most of the sisters come from Vietnam and from many different uh, Asian countries. When when we join the community, it's like we bring in all of our ancestors with us. You know, all of our beauty of our culture, which makes the community very rich. But we also have all kinds of habit energies、um, that can create suffering for ourselves and for others that we live closely with. And it's really like、um, living in a monastery. It's like living in a big family, or in a, a microcosmos, like a small society. Basically, everything that happens outside the monastery, I think, also happens inside of the monastery. But what's wonderful about living in monastery is that each one of us is a practitioner, and we all have different pace. Of practicing, so you cannot say after one year of practicing you should be like this, or after ten years you should be at this level of practice. You know, we all have different background, and we all have different pace of learning, and different things come up in our life. So you really can't say it's not like going to school and then you pass a test and you go to next level. It's not like that. But for sure, that we are all practicing. That's something.、Um, yeah, I can say with confidence. So. Um, of course, every day, you know, we bump into each other with little things because we come from different cultures. So even little things, you know, we have different ways of, you know, like even like cutting a carrot, for example. <laughs> you know, like if you have five sisters in the kitchen, they all have different ways of how carrot should be cut. You know, what kind of size, which directions, and and the New Hamlet is、uh, well known for good food and sisters cook really well. But that means also that everybody has a strong ideas about how food should be cooked. So, so there's one place that、uh, we all feel. I think many sisters feel very passionate about cooking. But that also means that the a lot of the kind of conflict can also happen around food. Yeah. So, so we face all kinds of like and you know small arguments to bigger arguments in our daily life. But at the same time, we all know that we are practicing, and sometimes you know something happens, and maybe we say we are not always one hundred percent mindful. So we might say something that could irritate the other person, and then if we are mindful, we are aware that oh, I've said something unskillful and I upset this sister. So you know,、um, sometimes you can apologize right away、mm-hmm. and make the situation fine. But there are other times where you have a bigger conflict, and we know that each one of us we need a bit more space and time to come back to ourselves and look into our own feeling and mental formations, or just、uh, our thinking, to see you know what what have I done to contribute to this conflict. And then usually after a few days,、um, you know. We just see how like silly the whole situation was, and and we don't even have to talk about it. Everything's fine, but then there are other times that we need to sit down and talk about things to undo the wrong you know, perceptions and misunderstanding. So, yeah. Can that sometimes sort of, you know, living in a community where there's this constant awareness? So is that does that have its downsides at all? Do you sometimes want a holiday and just go、yeah. down to the beach and have an ice cream and lie in the sun? <laughs> I think we have a lot of space,、um, so whenever we want to get away from other people, you know, we are so lucky that we're surrounded by beautiful nature. We can take a walk on a plum orchard or in the forest, and so we can always find ourselves space.、Um, and yeah, it's and we all share rooms. So it's like, for example, in my room, like I stay in a room bedroom with like. Five other sisters, so there are six of us. It's a little bit like、uh, living in a boarding school, I guess.、Um, and then, but it's interesting thing is like when we are in harmony, no matter how many people are in the room, it never feels like crowded. But it's when we have something that's you know that you know that there's an elephant in the room, you know, and there's something that something somebody is not happy with, and then suddenly you feel like, oh, there's there's not enough space. I need to run away. I need to go find my own space. So it's really interesting to see how when we feel spacious inside, like physical space outside doesn't really matter. You know, we can be anywhere, and we feel spacious and happy.、Mm. Yeah, and 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 I just want to say that there's a day in the week in the monastery we call it lazy day. It's one of the most holiest day in the week. It's where we don't have a practice schedule, and for each individual, we can schedule our own activity through that day. We can rest more. We can sleep in more. We can exercise more. We can study more. The only schedule is the meals, 
and and I think that's that's a day that we uh, we all cherish a lot, mm. and uh, we we also um, use that in order to kind of like press a refresh button for us for for the coming week. And and in a sense, I this I think this is one of the brilliant attributes of t- of Thich Nhat Hanh is that you know it's not about he hasn't made the practice rigid like you have to do eight hours sitting a day right. and that it's relentless. I mean, he has by the way he is he. he you're all doing a lot, but also you create spaciousness. Mm. Mm. But I have to say at the same time, this lazy day, it sounds so wonderful to have <laughs> this day off, but it's actually the most advanced practice. Right. Because we all have this habit energy of wanting to do many things, mm. you know, in our community. We have many projects mm. and we have an aspiration to do this and that, to bring the Dharma um, out to the world. So we're constantly, you know, have a, a full inbox and yeah, many projects and yeah, it's very um, difficult to stop ourselves and to just really enjoy the lazy day and just you know, not to plan your day and just to, like let the day unfold and be in the present moment. So that's something I'm really still practicing with. Wow. And sister, one other thing, you're you're um, an accomplished violinist, and you you know you before you became a nun, you were. You know, you were recognized as such. And I'm just wondering, is there any connection from your experience between mindfulness and playing music? Is there, is there just interested in, I've never asked you that. Mm. Yeah, I think it's everything has to do with mindfulness. And I think um, not only music, but um, in any profession, I think when you want to master your art, um, you cannot do it without the energy of mindfulness. And I think often people are doing that already without knowing the word mindfulness and concentration and insight. Um, it's only when you come in touch with the so-called Buddhist teaching that you are aware of, oh, it's actually mindfulness. So so looking back, um, you know, I think like all of my colleagues, even though you know, I think now, now the word mindfulness is very popular, but um, 10, 15 years ago, uh, when I was still working as a musician, uh, it, the word wasn't that well known yet. But uh, when they think about the way we used to work together in ensemble, in orchestra, I think everybody was very mindful. Um, because if you are not in the moment, you, you know, in the flow, mm-hmm. like you cannot really perform. You know, in, in classical music, the concert lasts for one hour, two hours, and you really have to be concentrated and be in harmony with everybody on stage. Mm, so yeah. it's very powerful. So it's, uh, mindfulness is not an, a new invention, but it's a, it's a way to help people to, to recognize an aspect of their life that can really support them. Mm. Mm. Uh, so sister, I, I also have a question. Is that after you became a nun, you know, the whole idea is like, you know, we let go of our talent, our past, and we were now a simple person that just meditates all day. <laughs> and then suddenly, um, one of the uniqueness of Plum Village is also allowing the younger generation to bring talent into the community. And so one of our our very well-known chant is Namo Valoki Teshvara. And before you came, um, we only did the chant with the guitar and the drum. And then suddenly we had you and Brother Fap Lin, who is another musician, and then we wanted to bring more music instrument into it. And so that became such a, um, such a performance in a way. But now that you, when you offer it, when you play the violin with the community chanting in front of everyone, do you see it different than before? Like, your um, your energy that you bring to it is it different than before? I mean, before I ordained, bef- like when I started playing like ten years ago. No, I, like before when you were when, performing. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah, um, because when I was working as a professional musician, um, the most important thing is like the perfection of the right. art, and as a professional, like you cannot make mistake on stage. And so that's why you have to really prepare yourself well, mentally, physically, before each performance. So you are, you know, at your best shape. And everybody's really focused and, you know, of course from time to time something would go wrong and mm-hmm. it's okay. But we really try to do our best um, to um, uh, achieve that kind of perfection. Mm. Um, but 
and of course <laughs> chanting Namavano Kiteshvara, it was it's really a great practice for me to let go of um what is um what is like good music basically because when they first heard brothers and sisters chant because our community uh you know we're not musically trained so no. everybody just chant wholeheartedly and you know i think there are many brothers and sisters who are naturally musical but you know it's not you know everybody's thing you know mm -hmm. but we are not we're not selective. We don't just like pick the good singers to, you know, offer the chant. It's the energy we produce uh, from our practice. So everybody goes up um, in front of the, the audience of our friends who come to the retreat mm -hmm. and we all chant together. And another thing is so we don't really practice. So we just go up and we offer our heart and to send the energy of compassion. So, um, yeah, it was very interesting for me because when I first heard, I was like, oh my goodness, it's like so out of tune, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but then I see everybody um, sitting there um, and feeling very touched by this um, collective energy of compassion. And they all, you know, many of our friends are in tears because they really feel that energy. And I was like, wow, this is like so interesting. And uh, in the beginning, I actually felt frustrated because... I was asked to play the violin um, to keep the pitch more or less in tune mm -hmm. so our brothers and sisters can tune into the violin um, and also to keep the, the rhythm. So pitch and rhythm is like two basic elements of music. Um, but then often I felt like, oh, like there's no sense of pitch, there's no sense of rhythm. It's kind of all over the place. But somehow there's something like as a collective organism, we have a um, way of chanting and uh, in a way rushing because um, the chant is usually lasts for like 20 minutes long and it starts out very slow and bit by bit it goes faster and faster and at the end the, the finishing tempo is different from the starting tempo which is in the in a, like standard music world this is like it's not good you know mm -hmm. it's not good practice you, you should keep the same tempo from beginning to the end you know, and also the pitch in it, got, it starts at the higher level and it slowly goes uh, lower and lower and lower. Um, so which is also you know something that it's not accepted in the in the professional world, but that that's how we chant. That's um, somehow we cultivated this habit mm. um, to chant this way. So in the beginning, I felt like this is wrong. So like I like I want to like talk to my sisters and brothers and point this thing out and try to make this better. But then this collective energy is so much stronger. So there's, I realized, okay, there's not much I can do. I just have to go with it and go with the flow. Let go. Yeah, letting go uh, of you know, how it's supposed to sound. And once I was able to let go, it just became so much more pleasant mm. experience for me. Not playing and thinking like, oh my goodness, it's out of tune. But it's just like, okay, I just blend myself into this river of uh, energy of uh, brothers and sisters chanting, you know, from their heart, and it's it's really um, an art, and also it reflects a way of living in our community because uh, we all come in with all kinds of ideas of right and wrong, and and from different cultures, um, different backgrounds, um, but when we still have that mindset, the first person who suffer is like ourselves, and mm -hmm. when I have the judgment. As I'm the one who's suffering and from that kind of narrow way of thinking. So it's really a practice mm -hmm. of letting go and just opening myself up and letting the Sangha carry me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's, a, that, that's such a wonderful example because isn't that true of us all? That when we let go of the way we think it ought to be or should be, we can be so much happier. Yeah. And if we're trying to impose on other people what we think is right, then we create unhappiness in ourselves and we create unhappiness in the people around us. Mm. So thank you, sister. So I want to finish off by um, asking you both mm -hmm. um, because this whole session is around uh, the art of mindfulness, the concentration, um, mindfulness, and then leading to an insight. And so I, I want to ask you first, brother, of a recent insight you've had, of something in uh, sort of recent months that... That would be, I know there's a there's a term in Plum Village called the fruit of our practice, which mm. is saying that actually as a result of our practice that that it does bear fruit, that something does come from that, that we can 
enjoy and makes our lives better. So is there anything that, that's happened to you that you can think of off the top of your head? Or actually, not at the top of your head, but deep in your heart, <laughs> that, that maybe has come up in the last few months? Mm. Wow, that's a really good question, Joe. This is a, a whole meditation in itself. Yeah, well, you can throw it back <laughs> at me. I'll have to think up an answer <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that um, I've been working on for myself is uh, acceptance. And I think this is this is very in line with um, what Sister uh, Jayim shared about learning to let go. And w- when I first started uh, to practice as a monk, like I, I have a very perfectionist uh, mind orientated. I want to be perfect in everything. And I, I still remember as a novice um, w- when I was like, today I'm going to be super mindful. And by, you know, three minutes in the day, I find myself losing it. I'm like, God. Oh my God, I got to start again. <laughs> and, then, and then I will repeat that again and again. And then slowly I start to realize that it's not about being perfect, but it's about just giving it your best, being aware of it. Because the moment you're aware that you are not mindful, you become mindful. Mm. And so it's just to allow yourself to embrace that. And, and that has allowed me now to embrace and to accept where I am in this community, where I need to be. And that allowed me also to to further deepen my aspiration. Yeah. Thank you. Sister, you've obviously already shared, but is there anything even, even very small that has just come to you recently as a sort of, ah, right, I get it, moment? Recently, mm, I think um, we've been in this pandemic. Uh, our monastery has been closed for over a year now mm-hmm. uh, and we've been offering many online retreats um, but before we closed the monastery you know we used to be so busy uh, receiving uh, guests or uh, retreat participants throughout the year sometimes we have 1000 friends um, practicing with us like in a summer retreat and when we are not hosting retreats we were often um, on tour teaching tours to different countries um, so we have a a very active lifestyle and I'm somebody who also likes to stay active and who likes to go out and be involved in different things. Um, but since um, we've closed our monastery door for this past year, um, we had more time to be with our own sisters, with our own monastic siblings. And I'm realizing that this is an area that I really want to um do better and it's something I want to invest in more like brother Fab who he's so much um, older than me in the Dharma age uh, Dharma age meaning how long we've been ordained um, but I've been ordained for about 11 years now so I'm about kind of like mid age um, I have um, like half of my sisters are older than me and half of my sisters are younger than me and I think it's really important to be present um, for each other uh, for the sisters that I live with um, because I realized that um, often sisters say like oh sister Chanya I'm so busy you know don't bother her and, and like I have many younger sisters they they said they've been wanting to talk to me and ask me and, and, and to teach them something but they often hesitated because they felt like I always look so busy and they don't want to bother me but actually whenever they ask me I'm so happy and I like to spend time with them so that's something I want to cultivate um, my practice so that I don't look like a busy nun all the time and with some work, but just to be there um, for my sisters, especially my younger sisters. And uh, yeah, that's something I never thought I would be feeling like 10 years ago, you know, when I ordained that, um, uh, yeah, that's a quality I want to develop. Because even before I ordained, I was the only child. I didn't have many siblings. So in a way, this is like a brand new practice for me to how to care for my younger siblings. Mm. So this is, yeah, it's, um, this past year has been really, uh, and in, a, in a way, kind of like a blessing. And I think many friends out there also uh, experience the same thing. Um, we have more time to spend with our own family members because um, the schools are closed. Uh, you cannot go to work. You have to work from home. And I think in our modern day world, uh, we don't spend enough time with each other. So suddenly when we have time to spend with each other, we don't know how. So we have to relearn almost, you know. So it's the same thing for me. And yeah, I'm finding uh, ways to be with my sisters and also with my brothers and, and with, with myself also. Yeah. And how about you, Joe? Oh, 
I knew that was coming. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, I think my biggest insult, insight, insult I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> now, now. <laughs> the, the, the power of words. Yeah. Um, was um, just over a year ago when um, I was, so I was working in New York and I was on the senior leadership team of the Huff Post, Huffington Post, and always sort of super busy and living in the center of a very busy city. Um, but actually what I was realizing in my work, I was working, I was trying to change the world at scale. In a sense, I was writing and commissioning and editing stories that I hoped would help people to see the world with fresh eyes. But, um, but I realized in that that I had lost my own connection to the intimacy of this work. Mm -hmm. So while I was, it was almost like a one-way street. I kept on giving, but I wasn't really getting very much back. And I realized that I wanted to come back to a feeling of intimacy, that of deep connection with myself so that when whatever I did in my life, that it would come from the very heart of me rather than just as a something from the outside of me. Um, and that sort of coincided with, with this wish, which was um, uh, very much inspired by my wife to come and live next to Plum Village. And, and I think behind that was just this deep wish to be, to slow down, to be part of the community, part, part of a community, to feel that sort of deep sense of belonging, of, uh, of shared understanding, of, of a wish to, that I didn't have to do things on my own. I realized that I was in a lot of I spoke at a lot of conferences and chaired a lot of things where I was often the only person in the room trying to help people to see the power of these practices. So it was lovely just to be part of the practice. Mm -hmm. and, and then coming here, what I realized was actually I still wanted to have an impact in the world. I didn't want to disappear. And, and one of the wonderful things about Plum Village is you're not sitting as a, here as a monastery in an insular way. You're, you're, you're creating this practice center and this, this practice in order to help the world. And so it made me realize that actually I still wanted to create at scale. I still wanted to have an impact at scale, but I wanted to do it from a place of intimacy, which means that I, I'm now working with, with leaders in the climate movement and sustainability movement and international development movement. Um, in order to help people who are creating at scale to actually come home to themselves. So that when people, that there's so many people who are trying to change the world and are burning out and they don't really realize that what we know is that you can only change the world if you change yourself. So the recognition for me is to come back to myself in order to help other people to come back to myself, which I think is the mindfulness practice. I come back to myself, I steady myself, I, I come back to the center, I'm aware, I'm present. And uh, what I've learned from Thich Nhat Hanh is uh, I, I'm able more to embody the practice. So I don't have to say much because hopefully I, I represent it in who I am. And that means that when I reach out and su support other people that I can model that and so that they themselves can come back to themselves and therefore have even more impact in the world. So, so the, the great insight was that to create change in our world, we really have to come back to ourselves. And when we come back to ourselves, wow, we can really change the world. Mm, beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and listening to our podcast today. And uh, this is the segment where we will invite all of you to practice a little meditation with us. So whether you are... Um, sitting on a bus, sitting on your sofa, in a car, wherever you are, even if you're walking, if you can just uh, allow yourself to be still, whether you stop yourself, stand still, or find a place to sit, and just to connect to your breath. And today, Sister Dangim will guide us in a short meditation. Okay, so if you're sitting, uh, you can bring your hands and place them on your belly. And uh, you can also close your eyes um, as long as you're not driving. Um, if you're driving, uh, please do not close your eyes. <laughs> or hopefully you can pull to the side of the road and then enjoy five minutes of practice. So with our hands on our belly, you can breathe in, feeling the belly rising, breathing out. You can feel your belly falling. 
in rising, out falling. You can continue to breathe and feel your belly becoming softer and softer with each breath. And with next in-breath, we can bring our attention to our two shoulders. And breathing out, we can relax our shoulders. We've been carrying many things on our shoulders, responsibilities, worries, future plans. And with an out breath, we can let them all go. So our shoulders feel nice and light. Now with the next in-breath, we bring our attention to our two arms. Breathing out, we relax our two arms all the way from our shoulders, our elbows, forearms, our two hands. our fingers and continue to feel our belly rising and falling. Breathing in, now we bring our attention to our two legs. Breathing out, I send the energy of gratitude to my two legs. Thanks to my two legs, I can walk, I can run, I can dance, I can go to anywhere I want. I relax my thighs, relax my knees. Relax my calves. Relax my ankles. And relax my toes. Often when we're feeling tense or stressed, our toes are very tense. So whenever we notice the discomfort in our body, we can bring our attention to our toes. We can wiggle our toes, relax them, and smile to our toes. Breathing in, I enjoy my in-breath. Breathing out, I enjoy my out-breath.
Breathing in, I feel grateful to be alive right now in this moment. Breathing out, I send my energy of gratitude to all beings. Thank you, sister. And dear listeners, for joining us for this episode of The Way Out Is In. Um, you can catch us and all our episodes on uh, Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on all other platforms that carry podcasts, and also on the Plum Village app. Um, our, my own personal gratitude to the Plum Village tradition and to Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh and uh, for the support given to us by the Tignat Han Foundation. We'll meet again soon. Oh.